Hello, welcome to BEH 217 Behavioral Approaches. This presentation will discuss ethics and culture in behavioral approaches. So first let's talk about ethics. Ethical principles and issues are a basic part of your professional practice. The importance of ethical practice is because you need a sound foundation for making ethical decisions. You will learn that being an ethical practitioner is far more complex than a set of rules. There are multiple types of ethics. We have mandatory ethics, which involves a level, level of ethical functioning at the minimum level of professional practice. These are your basics. You don't have an uh, intimate relationship with a client. You do not provide drugs or alcohol to a client, etc. These are your basics. Then you have your aspirational ethics, which focuses on doing what is in the best interest of the clients. Functioning at the aspirational level involves the highest standards of thinking and conduct. It entails understanding the spirit of the code and the principles on which the code is based. This is something that you learn over time what is best for the client and every client is different so you know these are those kinds of standards that can shift based on the client then you have your positive ethics is an approach taken by practitioners who want to do their best for their clients rather than simply meet minimum standards to stay out of trouble and these overlap if you think of a Venn diagram with aspirational ethics so why do we need ethics? Our professional relationships with our clients exist for their benefit. It is not unethical for us to meet our personal needs through our professional work, but it is essential that these needs be kept in perspective. As helping professionals, we must actively work toward expanding our self-awareness and learn to recognize our areas of prejudice and vulnerability. And you may say, I'm not a prejudiced person, but everybody deep down inside has something that they have a bias about, even if it's a bias believing that people who are like themselves are the best kind of people. The ready-made answers to ethical dilemmas provided by professional organizations typically contain only broad guidelines for responsible practice. They don't get down to the nitty gritty. In practice, you have to apply the ethics codes of your profession to the many practical problems you face. Professionals are expected to exercise prudent judgment when it comes to interpreting and apply ethical principles to specific situations. So those ethical standards provide a framework for any particular situation that can occur. So whether it is finding out that your client who is supposed to be um, abstaining from drugs and alcohol has relapsed, or your client who is suffering from depression, or a client who is dealing with family problems, no matter what the situation, those ethical frameworks can provide a guiding light for you on how to handle them. So, professional codes of ethics serve a number of purposes. One, they educate counseling practitioners and the general public about the responsibilities of the profession. Two, they provide a basis for accountability and protect clients from unethical practices. And three, most importantly, ethics codes provide a basis for reflecting on and improving your professional practice. So ethics helps you do a better job, and that's ultimately what we want to strive for throughout our careers. So let's talk about informed consent, which involves the right of clients to be informed about their therapy and to make autonomous decisions pertaining to it. By educating your clients about their rights and responsibilities, you are both empowering them and building a trusting relationship with them. Aspects of informed consent include the goals of the counseling, 
responsibilities of the counselor toward the client, responsibilities of clients, confidentiality, legal and ethical per parameters, qualifications and background of the practitioner, the fees involved in services, approximate length of the therapeutic process, benefit and risks involved with counseling, and if the client's case will be discussed with the therapist colleagues or supervisors. So, you know, within a large practice or in a hospital, the therapist may be responsible for discussing their caseload with colleagues. So that also has to be discussed. The challenge of fulfilling the spirit of informed consent is to strike a balance between giving clients too much information and giving them too little. For example, it is too late to tell minors that you intend to consult with their parents after they have disclosed that they are considering an abortion. Young clients have a right to know about the limitations of confidentiality before they make such a highly personal disclosure. So if you are working with a 14 or 15 year old, it is allowed to discuss the situation with their parents because they are a minor and the parent is legally responsible for them. Clients can be overwhelmed, however, if counselors go into too much detail initially about the interventions they are likely to make. It takes both intuition and skill for per per practitioners to strike a balance. Informed consent and counseling can be provided in written form, orally, or some combination of both. And it's usually in some combination of both. Now keeping in mind that informed consent is something that you intuitively develop a skill set about, again, it comes with more and more practice. And you begin to understand what to share, how to share it, and how much to share as you work with clients. Moving on to privileged communication and confidentiality. These are two related but somewhat different concepts. Both of these concepts are rooted in a client's right to privacy. Privileged communication is a legal concept that protects clients from having their confidential communication revealed in court without their permission. The legal concept of privileged communication only applies to individual counseling. It does not apply to group counseling, couples counseling, family therapy, child and adolescent therapy, or whenever there are more than two people in the room. And again, this is the legal concept. Confidentiality is an ethical concept. So keep those two differences in mind. And in most states, it is the legal duty of therapists not to disclose information about a client. So you have to know the laws of your state in which you are practicing. Confidentiality is central to developing a trusting and productive client-therapist relationship. Counselors have an ethical and legal responsibility to discuss the nature and purpose of confidentiality with their clients early in the counseling process. There are times when confidential information must be divulged. There is a legal requirement to break confidentiality in cases involving child abuse, abuse of the elderly, abuse of dependent adults, and when a client poses a danger to themselves or others. All mental health practitioners and interns need to be aware of their duty to report in these situations and to know the limitations of confidentiality. Here are some, some other circumstances in which information must legally be reported by the counselors. When the therapist believes a client under the age of 16 is the victim of incest, rape, child abuse, or some other crime. When the therapist determines that the client needs hospitalization. When information is made an issue in a court action when clients request that their records be released to them or to a third party. So again, there are a variety of circumstances that the therapist or mental health practitioner must be aware of and must know the laws of their own state in which they practice 
because state law is going to be different than federal laws. So moving on to culture and ethics. Cultural diversity is a fact of life in our world. To the extent that counselors are focused on the values of the dominant culture and insensitive to variation among groups and individuals, they are at risk for practicing unethically. Counselors need to understand and accept clients who have a different set of assumptions about life, and they need to be alert to the possibility of imposing their own world view. Over the last 20 years, um, the perception of homosexuality has changed radically in the United States, and initially it was seen as, well, if you're gay and you pray hard enough and you go to church, you won't be gay anymore. And there were groups that provided conversion therapy. Well, it has been proven time and time again by the people who actually ran the conversion therapy that it doesn't work. And the people who would run these groups would eventually come out and say, no matter how hard I tried, I couldn't not be gay. So, you know, if you are a therapist who is not comfortable working with gay clientele, that is an issue you have to work through or you cannot deal with gay clients because the idea of praying the gay away just doesn't work. And it's gotten so bad in some states that they've actually passed state laws against it. Um, California was the first state, I believe, to pass a law on conversion therapy. It's the same thing with different religions. If you are not a fan of Muslims, if you're not a fan of Jewish people, if you're not a fan of Southern Baptists, you need to get over your biases because it's really hard to avoid the cultural diversity that is the United States. Moving on to assessment and diagnosis, these are integrally related to the practice of counseling and psychotherapy and both are often viewed as essential for planning treatment. Assessment consists of evaluating the relevant factors in a client's life to identify themes for further exploration in the counseling process. Practitioners consider assessment as a part of the process that leads to a formal diagnosis. Diagnosis, which is sometimes part of the assessment process, so if you think of a circle and assessment on the left and diagnosis is on the right, it's a like a snake chasing its tail, consists of identifying a specific mental disorder based on a pattern of symptoms which you have assessed. Both assessment and diagnosis can be understood as providing direction for the treatment. The purpose of a diagnosis in counseling and psychotherapy is to identify disruptions in a client's present behavior and lifestyle. A diagnosis provides a working hypothesis that guides the practitioner in understanding the client. The therapy sessions provide useful clues about the nature of the client's problems. Thus, diagnosis begins with the intake interview and continues throughout the duration of therapy. The book of for guiding practitioners in making diagnostic assessments is the fifth edition of the American Psychiatric Association's Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, also known as the DSM-5, and it was most recently updated in 2013. The DSM-5 is based on a medical model of mental illness that defines problems as residing with the individual rather than in society. So it focuses on the person, not the society in which they live. So for example, and let's go back to the example about homosexuality, through the 1960s, homosexuality was seen as a mental disorder. Well, by the 1970s, as more and more people were coming out, especially doctors, professionals, lawyers, it was seen as a variation, plus add to that, the fact that homosexuality exists throughout the animal kingdom and again is recognized as a variation in evolution, it was no longer, it was taken off the DSM as a mental disorder. So 
society deemed it a mental disorder until it deemed it no longer a mental disorder. It does not take into account political, economic, social, and cultural factors in the lives of clients which may play a significant role in the problems of clients. The DSM system tends to pathologize clients, seeing their behavior as abnormal, perpetuating the oppression of clients from diverse groups. So up until really the 1990s, gay people were really allowed to be discriminated against until they started marching and fighting and going to court for their legal rights. You can compare this to any other group that has dealt with a significant amount of um, discrimination, you know, uh, biracial um, relationships were seen as illegal and ethical and immoral and again they had to go to court, they had to go through society for these things now they're seen as completely normal. You see a, an African American man and a white woman walking down the street and it's no big deal. Whereas 50 years ago you could go to jail for that. Barnett and Johnson suggest that practitioners give careful consideration before rendering a diagnosis and take into consideration the realities of discrimination, oppression, and racism in society and in the mental health disciplines. So for example, a woman who has been raped has an abject um, hatred of men. Well, this might be not necessarily a pathology as much as a reaction to being raped and is dealing with PTSD and not a personality disorder that, you know, could put her in a category, category of a mental health disorder as opposed to a mental health disorder related to stress and PTSD. Both the feminist perspective and the postmodern approaches charge that these diagnoses ignore the societal context. And this is a very important um, discussion these days because a lot of things like um, postpartum depression were ignored for decades and they're finally coming to the forefront as real issues that need to be treated. You know, back in the day, a woman who had a and went into a postpartum depression, her hormones and her serotonin levels fell, you know, she was seen as, oh, you just need to get your hair done and put on some lipstick. No, she had some serious issues. And these women would go through hell before they would be able to get through it. Sometimes they might hurt their child or they would leave their child and abandon their families because they couldn't handle all of the emotional um, terror they were dealing with. Even though some practitioners may avoid formal diagnostic procedures and terminology, making hypotheses and sharing them with clients throughout the process is a form of ongoing diagnosis. So let's talk about the ethics of diagnosis. Ethical dilemmas may be created when diagnosis is done strictly for insurance purposes which often entails arbitrarily assigning a client to a diagnostic classification. However, it is a clinical, legal, and ethical obligation of therapists to screen clients for life-threatening problems such as organic disorders, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, and suicidal types of depression. Students need to learn the skills necessary to do this type of screening, which is a form of diagnostic thinking. A shift has occurred toward promoting the use of specific interventions for specific problems or diagnoses based on empirically supported treatments. So, you know, what we're looking at here is what actually works, not just what worked 10 or 20 or 30 years ago, what is working now. And this is called evidence-based practice. This trend towards specific empirically supported treatment is referred to as evidence-based practice. The integration of the best available research with clinical expertise in the context of patient characteristics, culture, and preferences. And this is from the Presidential Task Force on Evidence-Based Practice in 2006. 
Increasingly, these practitioners who work in a behavioral health care system must cope with the challenges associated with evidence-based practice. So you have three aspects, the research, your clinical expertise, and the patient's values and preferences. Some patients do not want to go on medications. Some patients want to be on medications. So you have to balance what they prefer and what they need and what your experience tells you and what the evidence shows works best. Norcross, Hogan, and Kucher advocate for inclusive evidence-based practices that incorporate the three pillars of evidence-based practices. One, looking for the best available research. Two, relying on clinical expertise. And three, taking into consideration the client's characteristics, culture, and preferences. Relying exclusively on standardized treatments for specific problems may raise another set of ethical concerns because of the reliability and validity of these empirically based techniques is questionable. Norcross and his colleagues contend that the call for accountability in mental health care is here to stay and that all mental health professionals are challenged by the mandate to demonstrate the efficiency and safety of the services they provide. So what we're looking at here is we have to look at the research studies not by themselves but overall. Is this a study that's been replicated? Do we see it working time and time and time again or is it a one and done? And that is a very important aspect to research because if it's a one and done that doesn't necessarily prove anything. It just shows a one-time uh, connection, correlation, cause and effect. So you have to look for a trend-based evidence they emphasize that the overarching goal of evidence-based practice is to enhance the effectiveness of client services and to improve public health and warn that mental health professionals need to take a proactive stance to make sure this goal is kept in focus. They realize there is, a, there is potential for misuse and abuse by third-party payers who could selectively use research findings as cost containment measures rather than ways of improving the quality of services delivered. And of course, the fear is that, you know, insurance companies are more focused on cost and what we want to avoid is them saying, well, it's cheaper to just diagnose them with depression and give them some uh, antidepressants and move on with your day and not waste a lot of time talking out therapy. That obviously is not going to work for every patient. So we have to balance a lot of these outcomes on what is the best course of action for the patient. Now we're going to talk about an ethical issue of dual or multiple relationships with a client and whether these relationships are sexual or non-sexual they occur when counselors assume two or more roles simultaneously or sequentially with a client. When clinicians blend their professional relationship with another kind of relationship with a client, ethical concerns must be considered. Many forms of non-professional interactions or non-sexual multiple relationships pose a challenge to practitioners. Some examples of non-sexual dual or multiple relationships are combining the roles of teacher and therapist or of supervisor and therapist, bartering for goods or therapeutic services, meaning, hey, you're an accountant. Will you do my taxes if I do therapy and we won't exchange cash? That's actually unethical. Borrowing money from a client, providing therapy to a friend, there's just too many complications there. An employee or a relative engaging in a social relationship with a client, accepting a, an expensive gift from a client. Client shows up and says, here I bought you this diamond ring. Yeah, definitely not a good idea. Ethical reasoning and judgment come into play when ethics codes are applied to specific situations. The ACA Code of Ethics makes it clear that counseling professionals must learn how to manage multiple roles and responsibilities in an ethical way. The ethics codes do not mandate avoidance of all such relationships. However, nor do the codes imply that non-sexual multiple relationships are unethical. 
In working through a multiple relationship concern, it is best to begin by ascertaining whether such a relationship can be avoided. Neji points out that multiple relationships cannot always be avoided, especially in small towns, nor should every multiple relationship be considered unethical. So if you're doing therapy in a small town and the person who is the waitress at the diner where you go for lunch every day is one of your clients, it's not like you're going to have uh, the ability to ignore them. You're going to have to interact with them and have conversations and say, hey, how's your life? How's you know, what you do over the weekend kind of conversation you have with somebody you see on a regular basis. So we're going to finish up talking about boundaries and these are um, establishing and maintaining consistent yet flexible boundaries as necessary if you are going to effectively counsel clients. One important aspect of maintaining appropriate professional boundaries is to recognize boundary crossings and prevent them from becoming boundary violations. A boundary crossing is a departure from a commonly accepted practice that could potentially benefit a client. For example, attending the wedding of a client may be extending a boundary, but it could be beneficial for the client. So if the client had come to you because they were having problems forming interpersonal relationships and over the course of a couple years of therapy, they were able to initiate, develop, and um, to the extent of getting married, a relationship with somebody, you know, coming to their wedding might be the way that begins the end of therapy and it would become part of that process of finishing up the therapeutic process. In contrast, a boundary violation is a serious breach that harms the client and is therefore unethical. A boundary violation is a boundary crossing that takes the practitioner out of the professional role, generally involves exploitation, and results in harm to a client. As you become involved in counseling, you will find that you will have to interpret the ethical guidelines of your professional organization. You will have to assume responsibility for deciding how to act in ways that will further the best interests of your clients. Throughout your professional life, you will need to re-examine the ethical questions raised in this chapter. Becoming a practitioner is not a final destination, but a journey that will continue throughout your career. And again, you know, throughout your career, which whether it lasts 20, 30, 40, 50 years, you know, things are going to change. Society changes, medical science changes, and it is incumbent upon you to maintain and keep up with this information. So that's it for this presentation. If you have any questions, please email or text me. If you're not in my class, please feel free to leave a comment and I will get back to you as soon as I can. Otherwise, have a phenomenal day.